sex work is work, but it is also sex. And any effort at all to regulate or control or criminalize consensual sexual activity between adults is wrong and leads to bad outcomes. After much technical difficulties, I torment our guest, but uh, she is here in the digital studio. It is Caitlin Bailey. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. <laughs> and uh, Caitlin is a sex worker, rights advocate, a stand-up comic and writer. Um, she's the founder and executive director of Old Pros and the host of the Oldest Profession podcast. And she is currently developing her one- second one-woman show, called whore's eye view i know i know your the website um has has info but can you can you give like a little summary of old pros and kind of what the deal with them is yeah sure uh thanks for asking um old pros is a nonprofit media organization focused on creating the conditions to change the status of sex workers in society so we create persuasive content across a variety of different medias, um, and we try to bring people together and change people's minds about the oldest profession. I kind of want to talk to you a little bit. Um, I don't know what you, how much you want to share, but how you got into sex work, and can you describe your politics, I guess? Oh, sure. I mean, I tell them that my mother was a Democrat, my father was a Republican, and I'm a comedian who is very <laughs> confident that arresting adults for engaging in consensual sex work is wrong and leads to bad outcomes. What is sex work? Sure. So, yeah, sex work is um, a really broad umbrella term that means any kind of exchange of erotic labor for money or something of value. So that includes, yes, full service prostitution. It also includes stripping, pornography, content creation, foot fetish model. Um, I want to include uh, Hooters waitresses um, because we're trying to build, you know, a big uh, broad tent. But yeah, so sex work is a, a, a really big um, sort of overarching category that includes both criminalized and legal or not criminalized work. Yeah, I mean, I think if, you know, it's sort of, I think the full service thing is maybe what people think of. Um, people who've been to a strip club, maybe, but have never, you know, actually hired someone personally. Sure. Is, is there a hierarchy there? I mean, porn is legal and yet, you know. I mean, you know, uh yeah, there's a we live in a hierarchical world, and so there's absolutely divisions within sex work. And I, you know, the same vastness of divisions exist in sex work as exists in food and bev. Right? You have uh, people who are trafficked into the service industry, right, where their employer is uh, holding their passport, and you have professional sommeliers and executive chefs uh, that live, you know, a very uh, glamorous and privileged life. And so the same spectrum of experience exists within sex work. But being criminalized has never um, increased anyone's negotiating power. <laughs> that is that that sounds about right. Um, yeah. What kind of stigma do people get, legal and otherwise? You know, sure. if people know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, this is a uh, all kinds of sex work is deeply stigmatized, right? So it doesn't matter if the work that you're doing is legal, you don't have a lot of protections. You know, there are only fans creators or strippers who lose their kids, they lose their house, they lose their job. People discriminate against sex workers all of the time with impunity. Um, doctors, service providers, sex workers, again, both legal and criminalized, don't report crimes committed against them because of the stigma around sex work. So it's definitely an issue that impacts all kinds of folks, regardless of where they are on that line. Uh, your longest buy on the website says that you worked two, for two years with state legislators all over the country, and then it became clear that we are not going to get good laws on this issue until we invest in cultural change. True. I almost feel like the, on, like the only thing that sounds more of a tall order than getting everything legalized is changing you know, especially sure. mechanical Americans' minds. About yeah. This. 
Well, I mean, I think it's important for us to remember that we've only criminalized prostitution for just over 100 years. This is a 19th century problem, you know, and I, I think it's possible to change people's minds on def- deeply entrenched issues like homophobia and misogyny. And I think that the stigma against sex workers in the oldest profession exists in the same category of things. And so the one of the tactics that we use is trying to make more people more aware of our shared history and legacy, right? Reminding us that we've all got a lot of great aunts or grandmothers that were philanthropists and entrepreneurs and, you know, uh, really active agents in their own lives who happen to do this work. And I believe that we can change the stories we tell about sex work and the, the distance of that history can really help people see past some of the more uh, visceral prejudices that come up for folks. I'm going to ask you if you find this to be true. This is me guessing, but I would say during the last five or so years, at least with the vocabulary, like the term sex work, sex worker, I, I seemed like it was more obscure. And now it's sort of the, the vocab of choice, even in mainstream discussion. Is there what, I mean, is that progress? Is that just rhetoric? Am I totally wrong about this? It's a wild time, you know? I mean, I will say that the I am seeing more and more folks use the phrase sex work, which is mm-hmm. super important. We are honored at Old Prose to have produced the memorial film for Carol Lee, who is the woman who coined the phrase sex work in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, and we are definitely starting to see more journalists use the right terminology. We are also starting to see people's bank accounts uh, seized for suspicious activity, for engaging in perfectly legal content creation work. We are starting to see folks stopped at the border because facial recognition technology has connected their face to their ad. So we are living in a surveillance period where it very much feels like we are on the ascent of a moral sex panic. So I'm thrilled to hear journalists using the right words and I'm terrified of border patrol. (laughs) So yeah, yeah, it's a scary, it's a wild time. I mean, I almost feel like um, sex workers have been a canary in the coal mine, um, you know. For sure. Frequently unsympathetic kind of right wing people getting kicked, have been kicked off of, you know, PayPal and certain other things lately. And they speak about it as if this, you know, they're the first people that this has happened to. And I have noticed that there was, you know, years ago I heard about this happening with the sex workers and I didn't care enough, much less, you know, them sure. paying any attention. No, I was I was frustrated on two fronts because um in 2018 when SESTA FOSTA passed, which is a, mm-hmm. a bad federal law, stands for Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking or Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, like many of these laws, it was sold to the American people as a way to crack down on sex trafficking and hurt and you know, excuse me, help vulnerable women and children. Um, It did no such thing. We did not rescue a single victim of child sexual exploitation or a victim of sex trafficking, but we did make it a lot harder to do this work safely uh, for adult consensual sex workers really all over the world. Um, But once that law was passed, I was working as a stand-up comedian, which really built itself as sort of a free speech absolutist community. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked at the non-reaction Um, so many of my peers had to what to me obviously looked like an existential threat to freedom of expression on the internet. And uh, there just wasn't a reaction. And here we are. I mean, I don't know if I should ask you to sum up exactly what SESTA did and what it says it 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 was sure. I, I can I can try to do that as, as quickly as possible. What SESTA FOSTA did was it created an exception to Article 230, right. which people will say is like, you know, some of the most important words that created the internet. And it created exceptions to the general policy that platforms are not responsible for what their users post, right? And it created an exception to that around this idea of sex trafficking under the same assumptions that we have been operating under for a long time, which is conflating prostitution with human trafficking, right? And so it created all of these perverse incentives for platforms to remove sex workers from their platform. So this is when Craigslist erotic services went away. Backpage was seized by the FBI. Mm-hmm. Same, same rent boy. Um, it became more and more difficult for you know sex workers to schedule and screen their clients, frankly. And so that's long story short, what Sesta Foster did. And it's both 
yeah, more complicated than that and also simpler than that, depending on which angle from history you want to uh, look at it from. That sounds like it's dangerous both to the the actual workers and to, as you said, free speech online in general. Correct. Yeah, it's an existential threat. It's the first It's the first shot across the bow to, to try to govern what previously had been kind of an ungovernable space, right? You know, I'm a child of the 90s. I was raised with the, with the free internet mm-hmm. where it was a place that like, all kinds of people could gather and say and do all kinds of things. And it revolutionized the oldest profession. It suddenly made it possible for sex workers to connect directly with their clients discreetly, uh, to exchange information, to do screening protocols and safety protocols, to exchange information with one another. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this idea that a place like Craigslist Erotic Services is dangerous for people when it is in fact one of the most effective ways of reducing the female homicide rate, reducing violence committed against sex workers. It's, um, it's very frustrating. Yeah. I seem to recall both when Sesta Foster was about to be passed that every sort of, you know, female Democrat call themselves a feminist person was like, yes, this will, we'll do this. And then everyone, every sex worker, everyone who knew anything was like this is bad oh it's embarrassing five minutes later oops oh this is there's some no consequences that we didn't realize oh you're hearing people acknowledge (laughs) consequences i would love to be forwarded those articles because i feel like we still live in the upside down where we are pretending like this was a great law that helped lots of vulnerable people but no sesta fosta uh was passed with overwhelming support across the aisle right mm-hmm. this was trump's law but it had 98 percent of the supporters in um in both houses of congress so this is a something i like to say about this is like you know prostitution is really the equal opportunity it's a bipartisan issue mm-hmm. because progressives are too busy pretending to help a population of people they can't be bothered to understand and republicans are honest about their visceral distaste of all things sexual so it really is um a slam dunk on that one can you elaborate more on the sort of, you know, supposedly well-meaning people who want to save you all from this? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really frustrating. But when prostitution becomes a symbol of exploitation, you end up hunting the people that you are ostensibly trying to help because the focus becomes on eradicating prostitution, Mm -hmm. not on eradicating exploitation. When we know that violence and exploitation are present across labor sectors, right? Whether you're talking about agriculture or mining or the service industry or domestic labors, we absolutely have examples of real slavery in this country. It is not overrepresented in sex work. Or if it is, that's a direct result of it being a criminalized uh, economy, right, pushed into the hands of criminals. And so I think it's really important for folks to understand that like pimps, for example, are absolutely an invention of criminalization, Mm -hmm. right? Before the criminalization of prostitution, which happened in the 19th century here in the U.S., uh, starting around 1910, finishing up around 1917, The entire industry was mostly run by madams that either ran their own business or were the the law of the land, right? They were the managers of these establishments. And this was a women-run business. This was an example where entrepreneur – this was one of the few avenues open to entrepreneurial women before we had property rights, before we won the right to vote. And so – the criminalization of prostitution, it suddenly became dangerous, not just for sex workers, but really for, you know, any woman to occupy public space without risking the fear of arrest, right? So starting in 1917, we institutionalized this policy called the American Plan um, to protect our soldiers from venereal disease that criminalized not just prostitution, but promiscuity. So that meant that if you were walking alone, eating alone, wrong place, wrong time, made the wrong kind of eye contact with a cop or caught in the wrong outfit, you risked being arrested and subjected to a not very accurate venereal disease test and being subjected to literal poison. Uh, It was decades before we found that penicillin was an effective treatment for venereal disease. So this meant that it was very dangerous for sex workers to procure their own clients. They needed a man to navigate public space for them in order to reduce the risk, not of kidnap and rape by a stranger, but by kidnap and rape from a cop. 
can you talk about the Nordic model that some I'd people love to talk about that? <laughs> Please have... give me an opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, there are four legal models for policing prostitution, period, across the board. There's criminalization. There's end demand policies, also known as the Nordic model, which we're about to talk about. There's legalization or regulation. And then there's decriminalization. And decriminalization, right, the removal of criminal laws and penalties is the only policy that reduces violence. You don't get there with regularization or licensing schemes or mandatory STI testing, right? We know this. We can look to Nevada, the only state in the union with legal regulated prostitution. It has the highest arrest rate per capita for prostitution-related offenses. The Nordic model or end-demand laws, right, often disguise themselves as decriminalization by saying things like, well, we're going to decriminalize prostitution, but we're going to make sex buying or renting an apartment to a sex worker or running the phone line for a sex worker a federal offense. And so you cannot criminalize half of a transaction, but everywhere these policies have been implemented, and they've been implemented for decades in places like Norway, Ireland, Canada, Everywhere we see these laws, you see violence against sex workers goes up because these laws systematically reduce the negotiating power of providers. Sex work is at its core a sales job. Sellers always need to sell more than buyers need to buy. When you criminalize buying, you give potential clients an advantage to force sex workers to do more for less, to take more risks, and you disincentivize the cooperation for basic screening questions, right? Why would I, as a reasonable and rational client, offer my legal name and two industry references to someone I've never met before when I'm the one facing criminal charges? But also, how do you as a provider know that I'm not a a reasonable, rational person instead of a predator disguising themselves as a nervous client? So it creates all of these ways that turn the temperature up on stigma against sex work and create new perverse opportunities to exploit sex workers, whether that means making people do more for less or murdering them. I only remember this anecdotally, but... I thought it was in Alaska where they were trying a version of constricting the supply of of yeah. buyers, and a woman said that was why she was less rigorous in who she picked, and it, you know, it went badly for her. Yes, yeah, it creates a lot of perverse incentives. It disrupts the systems that sex workers have cobbled together to keep ourselves safe, which we have for generations. And how do you keep yourself safe? Mostly sharing information, right, which is why SESTA-FOSTA and the criminalization of, you know, speech online or the threat to -to end-to-end encryption is such a threat. It really prevents sex workers from being able to exchange critical information with one another. Do you find that very fourth amendment, like I'm thinking of like EFF, um, ACLU, do they... Are they on your team? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, broadly, but specifically, like, like you particularly need these protections. I feel, I don't know, I just feel like you guys should team up, you know, more overtly, perhaps. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, we're a nonprofit media organization, right? I spent two years as a, a lobbyist um, working, uh, you know, in politics, and I, God bless to everyone that's doing that work, right? So I think that we can all be moving in the same direction, uh, focusing on you know the the tools and skills that we have available to us, and mine is media and content creation, right, um, and specifically history. But the ACLU has been with us on these issues for years, as has Amnesty International, World Health Organization, the Freedom Network, which is the largest network of service providers for victims of trafficking in the country. Okay. So we have a lot of strong allies that are with us on these issues. Whether or not this is their top priority fight is a completely different question. So the ACLU has a lot of smart things to say about why the decriminalization of sex work is the best policy. I don't know how many resources they've deployed in order to make that a political reality or to get in the way of some of these terrible laws that we see coming. Do you think that many of the people sincerely are worried about, I mean, women, because I think they're picturing women, you know, 
that they're sure. really in peril and they need to be rescued. Like how many people are there that really just like, oh, this is awful and no one would pick that and we just have to protect them. We are all swimming in propaganda waters, right, that have been working very hard to conflate prostitution with white slavery or human trafficking for over a hundred years. I absolutely believe that there are people who think that Taken was basically a documentary <laughs> and they don't have or they are not aware that they are already in community with sex workers, right? Mm -hmm. We are very closeted. There are not a lot of incentives for outing ourselves to community. So because the shame and stigma creates this silence, media has really filled that vacuum with horrific stories and images that get parroted on the evening news. I mean, I remember when Robert Kraft, right, first came up in the media in 2018. Um, he's the owner of the Patriots. He got caught up in a massage parlor staying in South Florida. Um, actually, I think it was in 2020. It, it doesn't matter. But he, the most media outlets were genuinely reporting that as an example of law enforcement rescuing sex slaves from an international sex trafficking ring. Never mind that Everyone involved was over the age of 30. Mm -hmm. Never mind that all of the practitioners were legally licensed masseurs working legally in the U.S. Never mind that none of them wanted to cooperate with the police. And never mind that being arrested is not a rescue. This, that's the way that this media narrative was sold. And it took a lot of digging and good reporting on behalf of like Mei Zhang and Elizabeth Nolan Brown to reveal the much more complicated story, which is that, you know, we spent millions and millions of taxpayer dollars making sure that the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and three local law enforcement agencies could record what I think could fairly be described as the world's most boring porn. <laughs> Surely if, you know, they were all being rescued, you wouldn't see so many perp walks of, like, women from a massage parlor that I know I've right. seen done. Right. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think that you it takes a lot of work to go past the headline, right? When you read in the local paper of like, oh, a sex trafficking ring was broken up, says who? The police. Well, that must have happened. And what we don't realize is that vice departments across the country are funded conflating adult consensual sex workers with trafficking victims. So they set up stings, they LARP as sex workers or providers or whatever, and they arrest as many sex workers as possible because we're easy to find and we're easy to handle. And they call that anti-trafficking and they unlock all of this federal money, all of this charitable money committed to ending human trafficking, which we have conflated with prostitution. And all of that diverts resources away from real victims of actual trafficking. And in the process, we ruin a lot of people's lives. The most effective, fastest way to trap somebody into a life of prostitution is to arrest them for it. Again, I don't want to just like, like uh, needle you about other people's motivations, but it feels like not just QAnon, but also like QAnon, like human trafficking. Again, it feels like in the last five or 10 years became like a big, like, oh, it, like there's 100,000, there's 500,000. Maybe it's because I'm a historically minded person and I've been studying the history of this for so long, but it's just so obvious to me that QAnon is the satanic panic, yes. right? <laughs> Which is the white slave panic, mm -hmm. right? Which is the blood libel panic, right? We've just had these, I don't know, scapegoat fantasies about a group of socially isolated, otherized people who are coming and kidnapping and sexually exploiting our children. When what's actually been happening the whole time is that people within our own communities are sexually exploiting our children. Mm -hmm. And I think it, there really is this deep, dark fantasy or this, I don't know, some kind of ego protection where we are unwilling to look at ourselves. We are unwilling to look within our own house. And instead we keep building these fortresses and we keep dehumanizing, you know, these groups of folks. And we are doing it all in the name of protecting our children while doing the opposite of protecting our children. 
there's just so much, of, you know, again, the children are in peril from, I mean, apparently The children are queens. in peril from sex stuff. The children mm-hmm. are in peril from scrolling. The children are in peril because of uh, candy-flavored cigarettes. The children mm-hmm. are in peril because, I mean, it's, yeah, we, we keep um, really creating these symbols to avoid uh, addressing whatever often solvable problems there are. But my basic thesis or a pithy a pithy version of it is that people who make other people come right even for money even covered in glitter in a bathhouse (laughs) are not the thing tearing society apart not during the time of abraham not during the time of jesus and not right now i guess back to some uh principal things as opposed to these practical things which you've certainly made your case on is there a principle that sort of defends the right to sex work? I mean, that seems like an easy question, but obviously people disagree that do you have the right? Why do you have the right to sex work? I don't I don't know that anyone is ta- taking the stand that you do have a right to sex work. I, I think it's very important for us to keep front and center that sex workers are not commodities. Mm-hmm. We are people. We are service providers. Right. Like nobody has a right to manicures. Right. Like if you're. <laughs> the worst you know way sex workers maintain their right to refuse service in the way that any service provider would um but i do think that we as a species need touch and intimacy and sex is a part of that there have been too many people who have had a whole life of celibacy for me to sit here and pretend that it's like absolutely necessary like breathing or water but we are a deeply social species and it makes all the sense that this is something that people want Mm -hmm. in a very genuine and earnest and not at all strange or pathological way i kind of want to talk about turfs and swerfs i guess i just feel like there's 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 more you know alliances that should exist like um i know a trans girl who wrote an article about sort of trying to tie the right to abortion to the right to be trans to have you know whatever that's that seems like what it is right but uh totally and sex workers are right up in there i mean is there why are swerfs like why Why are swerfs (laughs) great question i mean it's hard saying why are turfs right like if you uh you know when when i was playing spin the what's next on the feminist dial or whatever (laughs) i never would have guessed that my foremothers would have committed themselves so thoroughly to upholding gender stereotypes as like a big important foundation for their feminism right Mm -hmm. like you don't look girly enough to be in this bathroom is not Mm -hmm. what i expected you know women who fought for our rights to uh to abortion to, to have and yet here we sit Yeah, I think that swerfs, you know, sex work exclusionary radical feminists, I think are a very reactionary group that have in some way bought into the patriarchal notion, right? Yeah, that makes sense. That, yeah, that you can divide women into groups and only some of them deserve rights. And that's the trick, right? That's what we've been doing for thousands and thousands of years. And I think it's important for contemporary feminists, especially ones who are fighting like to be paid more, fighting for a maternity leave or fighting for uh, you know property rights, recognize that sex workers, rather than operating in contrast to feminist objectives, have been living those objectives, paving space in male spaces, right? Owning their own property, directing their own lives, literally hundreds of years before uh, other women outside of this work won those rights. There's a lot more in common between what sex workers want and what feminists want than what separates us, right? I, I don't think that there is a separation. But I think it's, there's something about feminist identity that requires them to shame and dehumanize sex workers. And I don't know where that comes from, but it feels very aligned and like it's coming from the same kind of yucky place that turfiness comes from, right? Where it feels like an important ingredient to someone's identity to try to shame or otherize some other group of people. I'm going to try to imagine the nicest version of a swerf I think some of that comes from sort of the straw man 
uh, more complicated than that, but still version of sort of second wave feminism where it was like, why, you know, all heterosexual sex is rape. And so therefore, I mean, just like, there's like, I don't blame you for interpreting it as, you know, like, I think I'm better than the sex workers. That's why I think it should be outlawed. Sure. But is there a version of it where it's like, you know, okay, women get sort of objectified without wanting to be, therefore, a, you know, a sex worker is the ultimate version of objectification. Of this thing that I hate. Yeah. <laughs> like, I hate this. So, therefore, anyone participating in it is raping themselves. Yeah. I don't have that kind of relationship to sex. So, you know, I'm sorry. I wish everyone enthusiastic orgasms. That's my hope and prayer for everyone. But I do understand how victims of sexual trauma could arrive at a place where it would be unimaginable for them that somebody would consent to this work. I feel that way, right, about people that work in slaughterhouses, people mm -hmm. that go to war, mm -hmm. people that work with toxic chemicals. There are jobs that I can't imagine doing that I wish in my heart didn't exist. And also I know that sicking the police on those people isn't like helping. Mm -hmm. I guess I learned from, I don't know if you know Maggie McNeil at all. Oh, I love Maggie McNeil. <laughs> I even met her in real life once. It was a very auspicious day. Oh, yeah. She was in my neighborhood. But I think she's the one who made me start thinking just in basic terms of, you know, sometimes people defend the sex work like, oh, some people, you know, choose it like enthusiastically, the most enthusiastic. Sure. But like, we need to know that some people, if they, you know, had free money, maybe they wouldn't do it or as much. But that's OK to pick. You know, yeah, to but like hard to say most jobs. Right. That's, right. Like, that's yeah, what like, I got. Right, like, right, yeah, sure. OK. But would you be a middle manager if you didn't <laughs> need the money? Right. Really? Really? Like, <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Mean, again. Just, sorry. I said that, uh, Maggie, I, I didn't think I was thinking in those terms, but like that's that's an important lesson that like yes. the world is imperfect. We need to pick a job of some kind. Sure. Some people think this works for me. I can do this pretty well. I don't mind so much. There's yes. a lot of. You know, it's not glamorous. It's not like this is my life calling necessarily. And that's okay. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's that's most people's professional experience, right? I feel very lucky. I feel like I have a calling, right? I mm -hmm. felt called to sex work. I felt called to comedy. I felt called to advocacy. I'm very blessed. But I know a lot of lawyers uh, in my life who are up at night, who don't feel like they have control of their lives, who are very isolated, who seem to be living an absolutely miserable existence because of the debt slavery they're in because mm -hmm. of law school. And like that, to me, feels like a more obvious example of exploitation than any of my experiences with clients. Yeah, I mean, and even, again, I've fallen into sort of an overly this or that mindset where I thought, okay, I would probably rather work at Walmart than do sex work. But then I, I think someone pointed out, well, you're still thinking of it in terms of the full service thing. And again, it's like, I think a lot of people just think of that as the only version, sure. you know, the most dramatic. Yeah. Sex work is, has always meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Even within the spectrum of full service sex work, right? That looks differently for for everyone. Uh, again, I was very privileged and have always had the ability to negotiate boundaries at work, right? Whether that was being a waitress or working as a sex worker. So, you know, but I want to also point out that there's no guarantee that just because you're working at Walmart doesn't mean that you don't face sexual harassment mm -hmm. from your boss. And so, I mean, that was my experience working in Food and Bev. And what I appreciated about sex work is it allowed me to explicitly negotiate what was and was not going to happen. And I feel like in non-erotic workplaces, it's just not talked about, which always ends up hurting the person with less power. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Sometimes, you know, being too long in libertarian anarchist circles, sometimes I forget how to talk to people. Like, you still find someone who thinks, I don't know about legalizing, you know, drugs because they're bad for you. And like, sort sure. of, it's seen, it, it has now become obvious to me that you have to, for both practical and principal reasons, you have to legalize sex work. It's so obvious. Uh, I, one point of contention, decriminalize. 
uh, right. is what we're fighting for, right? We do not, we don't want to nationalize the Nevada model. It's bad for literally everyone except maybe brothel owners. Actually, now that I have you on that point, can you elaborate on that at all? Because absolutely yeah legalization or regulatory uh, you know regulations create a state enforced monopoly mm -hmm. right so for example in order to work at a legal licensed brothel in nevada of which there are only a few in rural counties right the, the, there is no way to work legally in vegas or reno then you have to register with the sheriff as a legally licensed prostitute oh. you can imagine how this comes up in like child custody cases this mm -hmm. becomes a subpoenable thing about you for the rest of your life uh you have have to subject yourself to a mandatory STI test. You have to be hired by a local brothel, right? Which is run between, I don't know, like a cross section of like comedy club bookers and restaurant owners, right? Like it's not a fun group. Anyone who gets a license in Nevada, by the way, they not only have to have an extraordinary amount of money to buy that license, they of also course. have to have the political connections to, to get in. So it's, it really is just this um, false enforcement of not, and it also creates incentives for the legal brothels to try to crack down on the criminalized competition. And so, yeah, in order, you have to um, you get hired by a brothel owner. There's not a lot of clarity between what's a state law, what's a county law, and what's like a brothel house policy. So you can imagine how this is leveraged. Sex workers have to work between 12 and 24 hour shifts. They're not allowed to leave the premise of the brothel during their shift. If they do, they have to be subjected to another STI test that they oh, have to man. pay for. <laughs> yeah, all of these laws, right, are not grounded in increasing the negotiating power of sex workers or reducing their exposure to exploitation. It's about containment and control mm -hmm. because we live in a deeply horphobic society, right? We live in this world with all of this these false narratives and we refuse to acknowledge that we already live in a society where sex workers just live and work amongst us that's always what it is i refuse to accept the reality that's already here so right. i'm gonna make things right. work for people right that is worse in the i did not i guess I, I never really looked into how it works in nevada just knowing it was legal that's that's wow that doesn't yeah. sound very good at all it's not I wonder if, though, if, again, sort of imagining a mainstream Democrat who thinks they're a feminist, say, is it hard to convince them that decriminalization is superior to, because, you know, the ones that think regulations sound nice. Sure, safe. right. Yeah, of course. There's, like, cases to be made for paternalistic worker protections, et cetera, mm. et cetera. But the, the reality is that, like, we just don't live in a society that has any interest in being nice to sex workers. And uh, there, we've done so much in the name of protect, like, protecting women right protecting children that is really all about coercive control like we criminalized abortion the first time around to protect women mm -hmm. and so i don't i don't have a magic wand i can't help the democrats think differently about this but uh, broadly but i'm doing my best on this one issue to help people see that sex work is work but it is also sex Mm -hmm. And that any effort at all to regulate or control or criminalize consensual sexual activity between adults is wrong and leads to bad outcomes. No argument there. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I just keep trying to con to create the mo like the most well-meaning opponent. <laughs> sure. <laughs> of you yeah. in my imagination, but <laughs> yeah. So um, again, in your longer bio, you t the, it mentions that you uh, worked for two years with state legislators all over the country and then it became clear that we're not going to get good laws in the issue until we... That sounds like it didn't go super well. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> I was going to ask you more in detail if you had any successes, if it was how frustrating it we was. We actually had or... a lot of... What, what shocked me is that behind closed doors, most reasonable people get it, actually. Okay. Reasonable people are not overrepresented in our state houses across the country, but they are there. Okay. And they do get it. They're terrified of their own constituency. Mm -hmm. They're they're terrified of being labeled a trafficker, mm -hmm. right? Or bought out by the pimp lobby or something. So I was working for um, a national organization, Decriminalized Sex Work, that is pursuing a state-by-state -state strategy to try to change the laws. And that work is being done, and it's going relatively well. There's been movement in Rhode Island, Vermont, Oregon. There was a long hearing in D.C. 
legislators are starting to listen to sex workers, right? We're not getting everything that we want all at once, but we are being heard. And more and more legislators on both sides of the aisle are starting to see through some of the rhetoric that contributes to some of these problems. I left decriminalized sex work for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. And one of them is because I didn't feel like my skills and talents were best deployed talking to legislators. And also that that work is being done by qualified and experienced people. I feel better positioned to talk to media and to try to reach a broader mainstream audience with these stories and this simple ask of asking people to reconsider what they think they know about the oldest profession. How big of a problem for this whole goal is religion? The origin story of whorephobia is the juxtaposition between the Abrahamic religions and priestess prostitutes, fragility temples, and these sort of older polytheistic temples that mm -hmm. often had sacred whores and sexually empowered women in positions of power. Whorephobia is the foundation of misogyny. And so much of these early religions, Judaism, Christianity, Muslims, is about demonizing women by demonizing whores. And that is squarely aimed at their main competitor, which were these polytheistic sort of like sex, drugs, and rock and, rock and roll temples that had <laughs> things on lock for thousands of years before we committed to patriarchy as the organizing principle. In um, Western Europe, well, at least based on, you know, opinion polls, et cetera, like religion is less, you know, of a driving force than America. We still are very... How is the acceptance in other places? I mean, is there is there progress going on in other places as well? Yeah, I mean, the sex workers of India are an inspiration to the world. Uh, they had a march for sex worker rights several years ago. Um, I think it was in the early 2000s that had 40,000 people show up. They are paving the way for property rights and protections for uh, stay-at-home moms. The sex workers are... They're doing great. Um, New Zealand decriminalized prostitution in 2003 with really persuasive results uh, that have been studied and published. Um, New South Wales and Denmark, I believe, just recommended the decriminalization of prostitution. As I mentioned before, groups like Amnesty International, the UN has studied this and is with us on these issues. But a lot of countries are going the other way. You know, the end demand laws are being pushed um, in a lot of uh, Western countries. But everywhere you look, sex workers are asking for the same things. I guess I, I'm still trying to think of, like, what are people thinking who have this, as you as you say, horror phobia? I mean, you, like, we, we talked about the religion. We talked about it being... Sex workers present an existential threat to the patriarchal order. Because you can't have a patriarchy if you don't know who the dads are. And the defining feature of whores or sex workers or prostitutes is that they are not beholden to one man. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that we have organized our society around with women as property, the nuclear family, purity, virginity, fidelity, monogamy, sex workers exist outside of all of that. And I think it's very, very threatening to a broad swath of people that have really bought in to that kind of patriarchal order as being foundational and necessary for a just or orderly society. And my position is that it's not. I mean, what is a woman, you know, if a woman is like, oh, I, I want to make, you know, I don't want to be like them. Like, what is she? <laughs> cool like, what what what's the horrible you know thing about if someone thinks you're a sex worker and you're not like what are like what are they thinking and when they're like how could you think i am sure yeah i mean like right now i think it's important i you know i don't want to underestimate or downplay the social costs 
of being associated with sex work, right? I mean, it makes sense for people who, you know, are interested in maintaining their status within their community to create as much distance as possible behind between them and sex workers or sex work adjacent things, right? That's why there's so much slut shaming. That's why there's so much energy governing around like what our girls wear or say or act or what their posture is. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that policing. But it's, you know, I don't think that's coming from an irrational place. I I live with that stigma, right? That's a choice that I've made. And so it it makes sense to me why, let's call it, you know, a civilian woman doesn't want to be associated with sex workers. But I think that it is a mistake to blame sex workers for that association and rather to sort of work towards a future where it is less of a problem for all of us, right? Whether you've done this work or not. But yeah, um, I, I mean, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I don't yeah. Just drone on and on. Yeah. What would success look like in your endeavors? But also, what is you know in the magical decriminalized world? You know, would there be more sex workers? Or would there be less? Like, what? What do you think I it think, would look I like? I think sex work is very similar to abortion. That you really can't diminish it. You can't erase it, but you can make it less safe. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that demand uh, or supply, for that matter, shot up in New Zealand when they decriminalized. There is some evidence to suggest that during the six year period that they decriminalized sex work in Rhode Island, that there was an uptick, at least in advertisement. But I think, honestly, that that would probably even out over time. But what success looks like for me is working towards a future where the sex workers that already exist within our communities are free to contribute the wisdom of their experiences uh, without the risk of arrest, losing their home, their job, or their children. That's what success would look like. That sounds pretty good. Thanks. How would you, um, obviously there's a lot of legal stuff involved, but the cultural stuff, I mean, do you have to change every mind so that like a mother you know, or a teacher, you know, doesn't lose their job because of their only fans, things, you know, you've actually seen before. I don't know. I think I feel very optimistic about that. You know, polling in 2018 showed that 44% of the electorate is ready to end the criminalization of adult consensual prostitution. That's way more people that were ready to end that than were ready to end the criminalization of homosexuality in the early 2000s, right? Really? Lawrence v. Texas came through. So I feel pretty optimistic from a political standpoint, but, you know, strategy is dynamic. Uh, There's looking around, a lot of reasons to be afraid. It doesn't seem like we're on a progressive march forward. But, uh, yeah, I don't think that you need uh, 100% of people to think that sex work is great in order to create a society where sex workers can live and work and operate without the constant fear, without being a criminalized class i'm yeah i mean I'm, as someone who doesn't know enough about it as i should i'm so i feel like there's it sounds like there's reasons for optimism i still think the human trafficking fear is so pronounced and you compare it to the satanic panic but reading about that it almost seems like until people woke up from the fever you know like you're talking about rationally talking to a legislator people being like mm, maybe but you're dealing with a, a lot of people who may sincerely be like, oh, they're kidnapping 100,000 children and women. Right. But how do you how do you counter just the pure irrational fear of it? I mean, I understand why people get emotional around talking about child sexual exploitation or sexual assault. I just wish there was some way for us to direct that energy at the actual perpetrators. I would love to see that energy brought to the ring. There are absolutely organized rings of predators. Mm -hmm. They're just operating freely in our churches and our schools. They are not operating as drag queens. They are not visibly queer. They are not trans. They are not sex workers. And they are not making porn. I mean, why would you be if you're trying to get away with... Such right. A thing, There's so you know? much paperwork in actual se- in actual porn, guys. That's mm-hmm. not. It's, yeah. What should you know your average person who is down with the cause be doing, you know, to help? 
I think a great first step would be to sign up for our weekly newsletter. That way you can stay in the know like an old pro. We do a roundup of sex worker rights related news from around the world. Uh, We deliver it in a pithy way. Uh, I am a comedian and so are the writers uh, I employ. Um, You can follow us on social media at old pros online. And this is, if this is an issue you really care about, I would suggest making um, a recurring, preferably a monthly contribution. You know, we're a brand, Brand new advocacy organization, less than 1% of philanthropy goes to sex worker rights oriented causes. Uh, we are paddling uphill, as it were. So if you can support this work and this is something you believe in, I encourage you to do that. And if I can't donate, I mean, is there anything like it, broadly supporting the cause of decriminalization? Should I be telling the people about it? Yeah. I mean, I would look up, um, it's worth penning a letter to your representative that you support the decriminalization of sex work and that you understand what that is, that helps a lot when sex workers or lobbyists or these organizations go and talk to their representatives. It helps if even one person has raised their hand um, and said, hey, this is this is something I believe in. It wouldn't scare me, right, if you if you support this. Um, I also really encourage people, and it's it's actually our theory of change, to activate amongst your own social groups, amongst your own peers. When you hear people spouting nonsense about human trafficking, push back against that. When you hear people purporting that we can somehow do something to reduce child sexual exploitation by censoring the internet harder, push back against that. That's what we do at Old Pros is we try to keep our followers and our listeners and our readers informed so that everyone has access to the talking points and the tidbits and the historical facts and the studies in order to be a more effective advocate. And it's really important for you to take that on if you've never done sex work. You know, we want to make sure that you can be a vocal ally because you're not taking on the risk of that whorephobia. You're not taking on the risk of that stigma. Um, And it's also a great way to let the coolest people in the room know that you're a chill hang. I was actually going to ask you, people who haven't done the work, you know, like, uh, this is very directly related to me, who who writes stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be speaking for people. I've never done that work at all. You know, like, what's my responsibility to not talk over them? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to be talking over folks, but if no one's talking, you're not talking over them. When you're writing your articles, when you have the space that you are taking up, use some of it to advocate for sex workers. Let your community know that you stand with sex workers on this issue. All right, I will. Great. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Is there anything we haven't covered that... You know. I mean, so much. I have, you know, <laughs> it's so much. But, but you know, it, look, this is a really big, broad, deep, old issue. It's mm. literally biblical. So it makes sense to me for folks that might be getting this information for the first time or are new to the issue. It can feel like drinking out of a fire hose. I encourage folks, check out oldprosonline.org. Follow us at Old Pros Online across platforms. If you can come to an event, show up. But the more you know, the less any of our laws about prostitution will make sense to you. And I guess finally, um, can you give me like three books, movies, anything that like is, is good for this subject, for learning or for just, you know, anything that fits with yes. this that people should check out? Yes, I can. If you are a history person, one of the best books out there is The Trials of Nina McCall, which is about the American plan and what the initial criminalization of prostitution in this country looked like, right? When we criminalized promiscuity around military bases. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great book. I will definitely, definitely read that. Contemporary anti-trafficking work in particular, I highly, highly recommend Melissa Hope Dittmore's new book, Unbroken Chains, where she takes a look at what actual trafficking actually looks like in the United States, including what violent sexual exploitation looks like, and does a really good job of helping to demonstrate why our anti-prostitution policies actively get in the way of our ability to do anything about the actual violence and the actual exploitation, which is for sure happening. 
another excellent classic book if you are interested in sort of broader sex worker history is From Stonewall to Slutwalk, which is a overview of the sex worker rights movement. It includes the history of Coyote, um, Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics, and how sex workers have been an integral part of the fight for LGBTQ plus rights, feminist rights. And, and, and th- there's one more piece. It, it, I don't know if this could be described as like a book or if it's actually a primary source document, but if you're like a super nerd, hmm. you should pick up a copy of The Vindication of the Rights of Whores. It's got a foreword by Margot St. James, and it is a combination. It, it's a document that came out of the 1986 International Whores Conference, where sex worker rights advocates from all over the world gathered in Amsterdam to answer the question, what do we want? I am a history nerd, so that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sorry to exploit <laughs> you. But but yes. Uh, yes. I can't believe I didn't really know about the American plan. That's um... You got to look up the American plan, mm-hmm. man. It's... uh. Yeah, scary stuff. And if you're if you're into historic fiction, or sorry, there's a, there's one more. I'm, I'm, this is not historic fiction. This is another nonfiction book. Um, but the man who hated women is a history of Anthony Comstock. He wrote oh. the Comstock Laws. Uh, he built his career attacking Victoria Woodhull. His name has come up again recently, trying to recriminalize uh, mailing abortion pills. So yeah, if uh, Anthony Comstock is unfortunately a still relevant um, character, he looms large in sex worker history and feminist history and the history of uh, criminalizing masturbation, which is a long, dark path. But anyway, I do recommend The Man Who Hated Women. Um, and I think it's a fair and earned title. Yeah, I was um, just working on a short article about uh, some post office Fourth Amendment shenanigans, and obviously I had to mention our not friend Comstock in there because yeah, and God, yeah, just reading the Wikipedia about him, I was like, wow, yeah, you know what? That title sounds perfect, like driving people to suicide and stuff, like yeah, set a time, you know, do punch bags or w- lift weights before, <laughs> after, or whatever you need to do, work work out your feelings, but educate yourself on Anthony Comstock for sure. I swear I'll let you go soon, but <laughs> I'm actually curious, you know, about fiction. Is there any good fictional portrayals? There's a great, uh, there's a great historic fiction. Actually, it's worth it. It's called Sex Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's an excellent historic fiction book chronicling the life of Victoria Woodhull and her sister, Tenny Chaflin, and their run-in uh, with Anthony Comstock and many others. Yeah, all of this sounds very interesting to me. This is all just like me wanting demanding reading materials but hopefully it's great yeah if you record me on a podcast you get more of my time for interested (laughs) parties i'm like book 30 minutes a month out i don't know well if you have anything like to you know to cap on all we just talked about but i feel like i've I've poked at you i i feel i feel thoroughly poked i feel like i got (laughs) an opportunity to um you know to promote old prose which is all i can ask for but yeah if seriously if this is something that you or your listeners are interested in that is what we that, that is the interest we serve at old pros so yeah please reach out is there any like i don't know if you have a personal twitter or anything you want to tell people to follow you on or just you can you can also find me on the internet i am caitlin bailey it is spelled in a weird way k a y t l i n most of the good stuff um and information again about sex worker rights goes to old pros but if you're interested in me making goofy faces from weird places on Instagram or uh, pithily oversharing um, on Twitter, then those experiences are available to you at Caitlin Bailey. Well, sold. I'll do it. Great. And as usual, people can follow me on Twitter if they want to. L-U-C-Y-S-T-A-G. Follow Nonservium, obviously, on all sorts of platforms. I think we're on Blue Sky now, which I don't, I'm not even cool enough to be invited to. <laughs> But um, thank you very much for this kind of bracing and makes me want to be helpful talk. Thank you. And um, yeah. And like I said, thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it.
You're listening to the Non-Serbian Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.